Today I am going to teach 10th Economics Unit 2 Globalization under Trade. Before going to the lesson, I want to tell some introduction of this lesson. LPG, I mean Liberalization, Privatization and Globalization have been much talked about the subjects among the politicians, businessmen and the economists. These three are the supporting pillars of new economic policy of our government which has been implemented since 1991. Now I want to tell you about what is my globalization. Globalization is a process of integrating various economies of the world without creating any barriers in the free flow of the goods and services, technology, capital and also labor. Under globalization, International market for uh, goods and services are integrated. In other words, globalization is uh, integration of your country with world economy. Next day, I'll be going to explain about history of globalization. The term globalization has been introduced by Professor Theodore Levitch. He explains uh, the globalization that is historical background of globalization in three stages. That is first one is archaic globalization, second one is proto-globalization and the third one is modern globalization. First I will be going to explain about archaic globalization. That is archaic globalization. Andre Kunter, that is Frank has been argued that a form of globalization that has been existed since the rise of the trade between Sumer and Indus Valley civilization during 3rd millennium BC. Uh, and early form of globalization is known as archaic globalization, which uh, explained about the Hellenistic uh, age. And uh, this has been uh, trade has been done between Roman Empire, Parthian Empire, and also Han Dynasty and it helps to create, to develop the Silk Road. An Islamic Golden Age was an another form of early globalization. The advent of the Mongols, they traveled through this Silk Road. This is about the archaic globalization. And next I will be going to explain about proto-globalization. The second stage of the globalization is known as proto-globalization which, uh, which is existed from the rise of the maritime Europeans. That is, it has been existed between 16th and 17th century. This uh, proto-globalization in 16th century, the Portuguese was the first. They came to India and they started their settlements First from Africa to Asia and to Brazil. Next, in 17th century, the globalization has been become a, a modern phenomena uh, which has been like English which was founded in 1600 was the first multinational firm and uh, they, they started in 1600. And the next, the Dutch East India Company which was being founded in 1600. To. This has been about the proto-globalization. Next I am going to explain about modern globalization. The 19th century witnessed a, a form of globalization that is advent of the globalization which approaching its modern form. It has been uh, existed between 19th and 20th century. There was uh, more different, significant differences in this centuries occurred in a trade. In the 20th century, it shows about the share of the rise of the trade and also the growth of the trade and the production of merchant and also the production of goods and services by the multinational firms. Multinational trade contract and agreement
agreement has been signed by two things. One is by the GATT. GATT means General Agreement of Tariff and Trade and also by WTO. That is World Trade Organization. Next uh, from uh, 1890 up to First World War, there was uh, uh, economic instability. And uh, but the first war when and uh, there was an economic stability occurs in the trade. Technological changes have lowered the cost, transport cost, and also it less the it takes a few hours to travel or to transport the goods from continents, one continent to another continent. Next, I am going to explain about trade and traders in South India. Before that, I want to tell some introduction traders. South Indian trade guilds has been started by merchant because in order to um, it has been started by the merchants in South India to create that is understanding between the European countries and also to the Indians. That is trade guilds has been formed through which many channels has been formed. Our Indian cultures has been exported to many other foreign countries. South Indian trade first dominated by Pallavas that is by the first by the Cholas and then it has been replaced by Pallavas. Next I am going to explain about yearly traders. In 1053 first the Kalinga traders they brought red colored stone decorative things and along with the cotton textiles to Southeast Asia for the trading purpose. And next, there are several trade guilds like such as um, Gatwas, Nagaras, Mumridandas, Haivoli 500, and then Buridas and Gauravas, etc. has been found in South India. Among this, Nagaras and Gauravas has been met in the temple premises. Next, I am going to explain about European traders in South India. Many European countries, they came to India to do their trading activities. First, they discovered a sea route from Portuguese to India by Vasco da Gama and through the Cape of Good Hope. Here, in the South India, Coastal and maritime trade has been monopolized by Europeans. Europeans in the sense, now I am going to tell you about Portuguese, Dutch, British, Danish and French. First Portuguese. Portuguese under the leadership of Vasco da Gama came to India and landed at Calicut. And the profit of the goods taken by Vasco da Gama was 40 times, I mean 40 to 60 times, that is the cost of the entire expedition to India. And his second trip, which was in 1502, came to India and he established the trading factories at Cochin, Calcutta and Kananur. Cochin was the headquarter of Portuguese in India. Next, I am going to explain about Dutch East India Company. The Dutch undertook several voyages from 1596 and established the Dutch East India Company in 1602. In 1605, Admiral Van der Hagen, he established the trading center at Mazuri Patinam, Devana Patinam and Nizama Patinam. In 1610, after getting negotiation transaction, that is permission from the Raja of Chandragiri, he founded another factory at Puliket. Later on, Puliket became the headquarter of Dutch in India. Next, I am going to explain about British. On 31st December 1600, here the Queen Elizabeth granted a charter to the East India Company. And between 1611, 
They established the trading factory at Musuli Patina and in 1626 they established trading factory at Pulicat. Sultan of Golconda gave the permission to English and offered them golden fiber which means they can do trade freely from their kingdom ports. In 1639 the British founded a built for fortified kingdom that is ports that is known as St. George Fort in Madras. Muslim Britain became the headquarters of British in India. Next I am going to explain about Danish East India Company. The Danish arrived in India in 1616 and established their Dutch Danish East India Company uh, in 1616 in Trankuba in Tamil Nadu. In 1620, Danish, that is, Tankabar became the headquarter of Danish East India Company in India. They failed to strengthen their power in India and they were forced to sell all their Indian settlements to British. Last, I am going to explain about French East India Company. In 1668, French East India Company started their settlements and established their trading center in India after getting permission from the Sultan of Golconda. Now, the that is Dutch took over the Pondicherry from French. Later, it was given back to them itself. After that, Pondicherry became the headquarters of French East India Company in India. Next, I am going to explain about globalization in India. That is globalization in India. In India, the period after 1980-81, it was marked by, that is, it was marked by number of things. In India, I mean uh, severe balance of payment difficulties. It is due to the hike in the oil price and also a yeah, Gulf War which was come between 1992 91 and hostilities in West Asia. Then India took the government in 1991, that is new government in 1991, uh, it faced payment crisis and also the finance of the state and the central government. Uh, marked a situation near bankruptcy. Since India had lost its credit worthiness in the international market, it mortgaged 40 tons of gold to the Bank of England. Under this situation, the government of India presented a new budget for 1992-91 and in July month. And which was which underlined that is LPG globalization, privatization, and uh, what liberalization, which was called as new economic policy. And this became strengthened after it was signed by the Brankel draft in 1994. After that, what I am going to tell in this new economic policy, so many policy has been changed. That is called as a revamps in the new economic policy. Now I will be going to explain about reforms of the new economic policy. First one is abolition of the industrial license except for few industries and a reduction in the number of the industries regarding their capitals. And then foreign exchange rate has been increased for the export of the goods. Next one is, um, it reduced the import duties and foreign exchange regulation has been amended. These are the reforms made in the new economic policy. Now by this I have completed the globalization. Now I am going to explain about MNC. MNC means multinational corporation. That is multinational corporation is nothing but it is a um, uh, corporation which owns and controls 
the production of goods and services in one country other than the one country. It is called as multinational organization. Otherwise, it is known as the transnational enterprise. Next, about this is the introduction of MNC. Now, I am going to explain about evolution of MNC. Evolution of MNC. Evolution is which is arrived. That is like the operations of the trading activities of the European countries which has been started in India are like this which is started its net throughout India and it politically dominated our India itself. Likewise, multinational corporation firms has been started its trading activity in host countries in 1920 and slowly started to move all over the India. This is the MNC. Here, uh, uh, most of the MNCs um, at the present day belongs to four major countries like USA, UK, France and Germany. Among this, uh, America is the largest MNC. Out of 15 in the world, 11 of the major MNCs belongs to America. Next, I am going to explain about growth of MNC. The common form of MNC which has been uh, participated in Indian industry which entering with the cooperation with the Indian industrialist. About 12,760 foreign collaboration agreements have been signed between 1948 to 1988 uh, for about yeah, 40 years uh, has been signed. As a result, foreign investment policy was being framed in 1991, which increased the flow of the goods uh, like a foreign direct investment to India. This is about the growth of the MNC in India. Next, I am going to explain about the reasons of the growth of the MNCs. Reason in the sense, I am going to explain about five reasons. Five reasons are first one is expansion of market territory. Second one is marketing superiority. Next, the third one is financial superiority. Next one is technology superiority. Last one is product innovations, finding new things. First, I am going to explain about expansion of market territory. Like the operations have a large sized firm has been increased in the expand uh, which is its more and more uh, corporations in that is throughout the India that is irrespective of the physical boundary of the country in, in our country. Next one is I am um, going to explain about the second one is marketing superiority that is multinational firms enjoys a marketing superiority over national firms and it also enjoys market reputation and face less difficulties in the case of sales that is a transport of the goods with the help of the new transport techniques. Next, I am going to explain about third financial superiority. It has, I mean, MNC has, has more finance resource and has more funds utilization. Because of the international reputation, it increases more international resources in India. This is about third financial superiority. Now, I am going to explain about technology superiority. The main reason why MNC has been encouraged the underdevelopment that is in the underdevelopment in the industrial is due to the technological superiority. This is the main reason in the MNCs. This is about the technology superiority. Fifth one is about product innovations. MNCs have research and the scientific which is engaged in the production of the new product and also superior designs in the existing product. 
This is about the product innovations in MNCs. Now I will be going to explain about two things that is advantage of MNCs and also the disadvantage of MNCs. Advantage of MNC means production of the same quality of goods with the lower cost and without transaction cost. One advantage. The next one is it deals with the detrimental effect of the environment. That is next. And another one is what now? MNC take advantage of tax variations. Next I am going to tell about disadvantage of MNCs. Disadvantage of MNC in the sense uh, next that is what I have to tell now. Uh, that is they are the corporations of uh, that is monopolies in their trading activities and uh, it has the fear of having a detrimental effect in the what trade. This is the disadvantage of MNCs. Next, I am going to explain about fair trade practice. Fair trade practice means it is a fair trade is a way of business which was aimed, which was aimed to keep the small farmers in the relation with the cap that is world market. This is the first aim. And another one is it aims uh, all the empower the consumers. It aims to empower the consumers to purchase the goods according to their values. I mean, it uh, yeah, raise and stabilize the income of the small scale farmers and also farm workers and also artisans. It uh, promotes labor rights and the rights of the workers to organize and also it promotes safe and sustainable working conditions and farming methods. It gives a full employment for all the persons. Fair trade is the better price with the decent working conditions and the fair terms of a trade between the farmer and also as well as with the workers. I want to tell here one thing about the um, multinational companies which existed in India in 2018. For it makes 10 multinationals, I want to tell it. Uh, that uh, will come in near the MNCs. That is, first one is Sony Corporation. Second one is Hale Left Picard. Third one is Tata Groups. Next one is Microsoft Corporation. Next one is IBM, Nettle next, and then Procter and Gamble, and then Tata Groups, Pepsi Company, and as well as Coca-Cola Company. These are the uh, 10 multinationals of our India in 2018. Now I am going to explain about the principles of a fair trade. Principles of the fair trade means uh, it, uh, it creates an opportunity for the um, economically advantaged producers and transparency and accountability. It ensures no child labor and as well as um, no forced labor. And uh, respect, uh, next one, last one is respect for environment. These are the principles of fair trade practice. Next, I am going to explain about GATT. GATT means it is a General Agreement of Tariff and Trade. This has been uh, signed in uh, 1947 and uh, India is one of the founding member of GATT. Director General of the GATT is uh, Sir Arthur Dunkel. He drafted a draft. He prepared a draft which is called as a Drunkel draft. The primary purpose of the GATT has been uh, they want to increase the international trade by reducing subsidies, tariffs and quotas. And uh, this has been uh, explained in, uh, done in many rounds of meetings. Now I am going to explain. This uh, uh, GATT has been, which has been implemented 
and became strengthened after the signing in 1994. Now I will be going to tell about the rounds of the GATT. First round has been held in Geneva, Switzerland in 1947. Second round in Anaxi in France between 1950 to 51. And the third in Targway, I mean a dark way in UK that is between 1950 to 51. Next one is fourth, fifth, and sixth round has been held in Geneva, Switzerland between 1956 to 1967. Next seventh round held in Tokyo, Japan in 1973 to 1979. Last and the eighth round has been held in Uruguay between 1986 to 1994. Um, this is called as a Uruguay round. This was the last round. By this, I am completing GATT. Next, I am going to explain about WTO, that is World Trade Organization. Here, the member nations of the GATT in the Uruguay round signed. Uh, in 1994, which paved the way for starting WTO in 1994. And this agreement was signed by 104 countries. And uh, this agreement has been coming to force January 1, 1995. I want to tell here, here three things in the WTO. That is, here this equator is Geneva, Switzerland. And uh, this started purpose is uh, for regulation and international trade. And there, uh, uh, that is members, Director General, four Deputy Director Generals and uh, 600 officials belongs to 80 countries. This is the three things about the WTO. Along with that, I want to tell about the principles of WTO. First principle is, to set and enforce rules for the international trade. It resolves the international disputes. Next, it gives ensure a full employment to all the persons. It gives that is it gives importance for the new decision making process. These are the principles of WTO. Next, I am going to explain about impact and the challenges of Globalization, this is our last heading. Impact in the sense, there are two types of impact. That is, one is positive impact and the other one is negative impact. One is positive impact and another one is negative impact of globalization. One is positive impact. Positive impact means that the globalization, it increased the standard level of the people in the fourth country. And it also increase, globalization increase GDP of our country. And it also increase new technology and the new research uh, method. And it also uh, increase the free flow of the goods and it increase the foreign direct investment. These are the positive impact. Next one is I am going to explain about negative impact. Too much flow of the capitals, uh, which leads to, which introduce unfair and immoral distribution of income. And then a second one is, that is, it gives, that is a fear for the international, inter, national integrity. And the last one is, environmental standard and regulation have been relaxed. These are the negative impact of globalization. Final thing I am going to explain about challenges of the globalization in India. The benefit of the globalization has been that is extended to all countries but it will not happen automatically. This is the first thing. And the second thing is the globalization which leads to economic instability in the developing world, I mean developing countries. Third one is, it leads to 
the it uh, it leads to no child labor and slavery in india next it uh, leads to environmental degradation next uh, it uh, leads to that is nowadays people started to use uh, use more junk food it will spoil their health and as well as it uh, spread more diseases to the people so my dear children so uh, that is don't prefer maximum the food from outside by this i am completing our uh, the economics second lesson globalization and the trade